I'm sure that all of you um, read this recently. I think it might have even gotten into uh, the newspapers, but uh, Boudreaux decided to pick Thibodeau up and take him to work one morning. And when he did, he Thibodeau jumped in Boudreaux's truck and Boudreaux had a real nice shiny thermos there and Thibodeau said, wow, that's pretty. He said, what is that? And Boudreaux said, that's my thermos that, that uh, my wife got me at Walmart. And he said, well, what does it do? And he said, well, it keeps the hot things hot and the cool things cool. And he said, okay. Well, around lunchtime, Thibodeau was amazed when Boudreaux poured hot gumbo out of his thermos. He couldn't believe that the, the gumbo was still hot. So the next day, when Boudreaux picked Thibodeau up for work, Thibodeau had a thermos. And Boudreaux said, hey, I see you got one of them thermos. He said, yeah. He said, Marie picked it up for me at Walmart. And he said, uh, you know, he said, you know how it's, you said it keeps the hot things hot and the cool things cool? And he said, yeah. Well, Thibodeau said, well, my thermos is better than yours. He said, why is that? He said, I got gumbo and a popsicle in mine. <laughs> Not sure he got that idea. <laughs> but who knows, it could have been a good combination. How many of you would like to please Father God? Amen. I think that's our aim in life. If nothing else, if we, if we miss every other mark in life, I think the greatest mark we could hit is to be a God pleaser. Is to know that what we're doing is pleasing Father God. And that's what I want to talk about today, that we could be father pleasers in our lives, that what we do and say and who we are is a reflection of our Heavenly Father. And of course, that was the case for Jesus. And we look in the scripture and uh, in John 8, 29, this is the words of Jesus. He said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, in other words, when you have crucified me, then you will know that I am he. I'm the one. I'm his son. You may not believe that now, but you will believe that I am he, and that I do nothing of my own, but speak exactly what the Father has taught me. Wouldn't that be great that we could say the same, that all I speak is what the Father teaches me. He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, because I always do what pleases the Father. Now remember the WWJD bracelets, what would Jesus do? You know, this is just a reminder of in our own lives, what would, how would Jesus respond in this situation? What would he do in this area? Well, I think we should ask ourselves too, what in my life is pleasing to the Father? What should I focus on that would please Father God? Rather than pleasing people or ourselves, we ought to be pleasing the Father. Can I get an Amen. Now, just a little review of what we've been covering, because I want to show you that we're tying all this in. We talked recently about realizing freedom, and we talked about unconscious bondage, where we sometimes don't even know areas of our life that we're bound in. And the only way to know that is when the Holy Spirit reveals it to us and shows us an area of our life that we have surrendered to the enemy. But when we talk about wanting to do the will of God, we talk about first desire, then ability, because we all desire to do the will of God, but we're not always able to do the will of God. But when our desire is pure and motivated by love for the Father, he gives us the ability to please him and accomplish his perfect will. I think another thing that we ought to strive for every day of our lives is to do the will of him who sent me, to do the will of the Father, not my will, but your will be done. And then we talked about hindrances, three specific ones that hinder us from keeping our hearts in submission to God and doing his will, and that's rebellion. We all have that streak in us. We got it from our ancestors who, in the very Garden of Eden, rebelled against God and his commands. We all have resentment at times, and we all have an independent spirit like Frank Sinatra. We're going to do it our way. Come on, somebody. Those are some hindrances that they're not in themselves evil unless we yield to them. We all know that we can rebel, but we don't have to rebel. We don't have to live in resentment, and we don't have to have an independent spirit, but we do. And so today I want to talk about we, we please the Father, and this is how, through alignment with God's will. Isn't that something? Because, see, you don't always have to want to do the will of God. Jonah didn't want to do the will of God. 
And Jesus even struggled in the garden saying, Father, if there's another way, if there's another way to do this, let this cup pass. We don't always have to, to desire everything about it, but what we do have to do is say, Father, nonetheless, your will be done, not mine. And why would we say that? Because Father knows best. There's a lot of things in my life, trust me, I would not have done, but I did it believing it was the will of God. People say, why did you do that? I felt God tell me to do that. Why would Abraham, after waiting 25 years for this precious son, take him up to a mountain to kill him? Now, a lot of us could have just told our wife, Man, I, th I thought I heard God say to take Isaac up on the mountain, but I had too much Domino's pizza last night. I think that was the pizza talking, not God. How many of you know we can talk ourselves out of the will of God real easy? Because it's not convenient. It's not what seems right. It's not what is natural. But when God speaks to us his will, we have to say, not my will, but your will be done. And when we do that, we align ourselves with God and we become a, a father pleaser because he's pleased with us. In fact, God, the only person in the Bible I know that God called his personal friend was Abraham. He said he was a friend of God. Be, why? Because I believe Abraham was so willing to please God, even to the sacrificing of his son that he waited 25 years for. And God said to him after that test, he said, now I know. Now I know I can trust you. And if God can trust you with a little, he can trust you with much. Now let's jump into this today. Let's unpack this. When we are aligned with God's will, we learn how to change our desires into ability. Hallelujah. It's not, it's not enough, James said, to be a hearer of the word. You got to be a doer of the word. In other words, if you hear the word and you don't do it, you, you failed the task. The idea is hear what God is saying to you and then go and do what God's will is regarding what he told you. That's one of the greatest lessons in life is we do what the Father says and we obey his will. And then Father God then, especially not only throughout our lives, but at the end, he says the most precious words we all want to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now you can enter into the kingdom I have prepared for you. But God tells us that on and on in our lives because we are pleasing the Father by doing his will. So when that happens, we then will also find that our character begins to conform to Jesus' character. In other words, we become more like him all the time. That should be our greatest goal, is to be more like him and less like ourselves. That, that he would increase while we are actually decreasing. That my old nature, my old man is is crumbling and decreasing while the new nature of Christ in me is increasing even more. And I believe that ought to be all the way until we breathe our last breath on this side of heaven. Come on, somebody. I don't think that's something that we can say we arrive. I think it's something that every day we press into that. Every day we say, God, am I more like you today than I was yesterday? God, am I pursuing you more than the things of this world? Am I pursuing a relationship with you and a, and a character that is defined by your word? Am I pursuing that or am I just kind of going through the motions? Because our natural hindrances will eventually become paths into God's kingdom. How many of you know we, we have to enter into the kingdom sometimes through much trouble? You, you know, the, the, the ticket, the price tag into the kingdom, you know, it, it's not money, it's not favor, it's trouble. It's heartache, it's battles that you and I face, but we're willing to face those battles because we know whose we are and we know who we are in Christ. And when you know who you are and, and who you belong to, you know that God's got you and he's got your back and he's covering you. He's covering you every step you take. He's your rear guard. He goes in front of you and he surrounds you. He's a, he's a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. Come on, somebody. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. And he's the one who is guiding you. The steps of a righteous person are ordered by the Lord. So wherever you go and whatever you're doing, you have to believe this is where God wants me to be because my steps are ordered by the Lord. Amen. Now, if that brings you too many times a week to, to Pizza Hut, you're going to have to pray about that. <laughs> I don't know that the Lord is leading you that many days a week to eat at Pizza Hut. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace himself 
Sanctify you what? Completely. We Sometimes we got partial sanctification because we only give God so much. God, you can have this area of my life, but not this one yet. Now, when we're young in the Lord and God understands that, that you're not trained yet, you haven't been discipled enough to know that God doesn't want 99.9% .9 of you. He wants 110% of you. But in discipleship, God gives grace because he knows that it's a process. But in time, we ought to be giving more and more of ourselves to God that he could sanctify us completely. And may our whole spirit, not half of our spirit, come on somebody, not half of our will be done. No, no, no. God, your whole will be done in my whole spirit for my whole life in Jesus' name. I want my whole soul and my whole body to be without blame at the coming of the Lord. But I have to keep yielding that to him day by day. I have, look, some of you said when you were eight, Lord, your will be done. But you haven't said it since. And you're older than eight. You got to keep saying that. You got to keep saying, you got to keep believing that. You got to keep living that. God, your will, your will, somehow, God, let your will be done in my life. The way I say it is, your will, your way, Yahweh. Because I do God's will sometimes. He said, good job, son, but you did it your way. You still got the Frank Sinatra spirit in you. Some of us will be obedient to the will of God, but we're going to do it the way we want to do it. God's like, that's not full obedience. If you want to do my will, you got to do my will my way. And when you do God's will, God's way, you are wholly sanctified. You are complete in him. Every part of you is surrendered to him. And that pleases Father God. Now watch. Let's get into the real world. The people who Jesus came to speak to on the earth and really helped them to convey that were the religious people. They wanted to do God's will their way. They wanted to serve God the way they wanted to serve God. And Jesus kept telling them over and over and over again, you can't serve God with your customs and your religious practices. You can't do it by your works. You can't do it by the merits that you think is good. You can't choose what you think God desires and what he, you have to know and ask God what it is, what's his will, and you got to do it his way. And they couldn't stand him. The people that fought him the most were the people who wanted to do God's will, but they wanted to do it their way. And Jesus said, the fact of the matter is, you're so stubborn in this that you don't even know the Father. Because if you knew the Father, you would know the Son. And if you know the Son, you would know the Father. But because you don't know me, you don't even know the one you proclaim to know. Because you want to serve God your way. You want to do it in the, in the fashion that you, want, you think God is pleased with. You want to earn your salvation so you can say you had something to do with it. You want to practice all these things because it makes you feel better about yourself. You want to dress in certain ways to impress people because you want them to be impressed with the external. But he said, I wouldn't want them to come anywhere near the internal you. Because he said on the outside you look like whitewashed tombs, but on the inside you're full of dead man's bones. Well, that's an interesting thing. I pay attention to stuff like that. I pay attention to those scriptures because that could be me, 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 me. That could be you, 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 you. That could easily be us. Because the reality is this. They didn't think that they needed to do anything different. They didn't think they were doing anything wrong. In fact, they thought they had it all right until the one who they proclaimed to serve told them, no, you don't. But they rejected him too. That's how, that's how serious religion can be. If you're telling the very God you think you proclaim to serve that you, he's wrong when the fact is you're the one who's wrong. Interesting. Now, when sin enters, it enters our mind, body, and soul. It doesn't just affect one area of our life. It comes through our thoughts, but then it penetrates our body and our soul. We can't trust our heart. How many of you know your heart has feelings that changes what, like the wind blows? You can't trust your mind because you know how many bad decisions you made just before you came to church this morning. 
when you get out of bed, you're making some bad decisions. <laughs> we certainly can't trust our own strength and ability. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us not to do that. It says to trust in the Lord with all your heart and with all your mind, with all your strength. Because why? Because if you trust in yourself, you're going to fail every single time. God wants to put the whole man's heart, soul, mind, and ability into perfect alignment with his will. To why? To set us completely free. Now, some of us got some freedom, but we still got some chains we're dragging around. You're free on some areas of your life, but you're still bound on others. What God wants is for you to let so far let go of everything else, to trust God like a free fall. That's when you're truly free, when you don't know what in the world you're doing. He said, what are you doing? Where are you going? I don't know. He tells me moment by moment. It's a walk of faith. Now, how many of you know in America, we don't walk by faith? The Bible says we, as a child of God, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by sight. We do. We want to walk by faith. That's our desire. But to get to that, we got to do a lot of things called surrendering our will to God's will that our desire can go from that to the ability to truly walk by faith. To truly walk by faith, you truly don't really know where your next meal might be coming from. To truly walk by faith, you don't know what tomorrow. But a lot, we got plans for six months, eight months, ten years from now. We got a, calendars, man. We know what we're going to do. And the Bible says, why do you say that? Why do you don't even know what tomorrow holds? That's what the Bible says. It says, you, you, you say we're going to go here and do there and do this and do that. And it's like, you don't even know if you're going to get there. I'm not against planning. I'm not, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not against that. I'm just saying if I'm going to walk by faith, I don't even know if tomorrow's coming. I, I hope Jesus comes before I finish this sermon. Amen. That would be wonderful. That would be amazing. Or at least maybe by the end of this week, that'd be all right. Surely before my, my next bill is due, come on, somebody. Amen. Jesus, it's your will, Lord, your will. Come on. <laughs> we, look, that's us. That's us. <laughs> and then you have to understand that God's will never changes. It's like this bar here. It's straight, and it ain't flexible. You can't bend this. I think Dupree could, but he's the only one in here that could do that. I think. I don't know. I think he could. But it forms the divine standard by which all our actions... Look, yeah. it don't matter what you think. It doesn't matter, you know, if you, if you feel like, you know, you, you, you got something, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the spirit. The reality is what matters is, is whether it's okay with Father God. You know, like a lot of times we, people put them, make themselves titles. You know, like uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the prophet and, and bishop and evangelist. You know, and you got like 12 of those and then their name is Bob. <laughs> but they don't want you to think about Bob. They want you to think about that guy's an evangelist, he's a prophet, he's, he's, he, he's, he's all that. Why? Because that makes me feel good about myself. But what I want to know is when's the last time you prophesied? And if you get it wrong, we're going to stone you to death. I, I don't even tell people I'm a pastor. <laughs> Man, they see how I drive. Like, what do you do? Uh, I, I'm a carpenter. <laughs> My older brother's a carpenter. That's what I do. I fix, uh, I fix people. <laughs> I, I don't tell them. I, they ask, maybe. But I don't usually say what I am because I, that's not who I am. I'm just a person who was wrecked in sin and has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and who has been turned from hell to heaven. I got my name in heaven. I got my name reserved for, for a mansion in heaven. But that ain't nothing I did. There's nothing I qualified for. It was only by the grace of God. And when he called me to be what I am, it was his will, not mine. And I submitted to his will to, to, to follow this calling and to follow his direction in my life only because it's his will and I know that's what pleases the Father. Yes. Amen. 
most Mondays, I like I, w I write out applications for like gas station attendant, you know, anything oh, convenience store clerk. I think, man, that'd be great, Lord. Anything but doing this. The reality is this: everything that we do, God measures, but He doesn't measure it with the standards of man. And that's where we fall short. We think, well, look, we, this is what we say. Well, I don't sin as much as so-and-so. I'm not that bad. You can, don't quit measuring yourself with imperfection. The only measurement you're to measure yourself with is Jesus Christ. Right. Measure yourself with him, and you're always going to come up short. But the desire is to be like him. The desire is to be more like him and less like me. Look, I may surpass you along the way or maybe not, but you're not my standard and I'm not yours. The standard is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's your standard. That's the one you've got to live up to. When you're going to stand before God, he's not going to measure you by any man or woman on planet earth, but he's going to measure you by what you did for his kingdom and for his glory. Amen. James 1.17 Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. God is always the same for everyone all the time. He doesn't bow or yield. He's not seduced by any man in any circumstance. No one can bribe, threaten, or deceive, or manipulate God. But how many have you have tried? Yeah, you did. You said, God, if you get me out of this this time, don't you lie. You did something really stupid. And you said, God, I promise I'll never do that again. And three weeks later, you're there. Oh, I mean, I didn't mean that. I mean, God doesn't change. And he certainly doesn't play games. He really doesn't. God's sincere. He doesn't change, but he doesn't play games. Hebrews says this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, you've got to believe that. One of the children came to me this morning and said, Pastor, if God created man who created God I said nobody and that's theology that most of us don't understand I can't explain that the Bible says he is he is he didn't say I was the great I was he said I'm the great I am he God is I don't know how God became but he is he was and he always will be now that's faith now, either we're all deluded and believe in something like that, or we're believing God and we're destined for eternity in heaven because he said he is and we believe he is, and that settles it. But that's all faith. You have never seen God. If you have, I want to talk to you after church. We have some talk, discussion to do. He's the same. He doesn't change. We change. We change on a dime. We change all the time, but God never changes. God is always the same. Jesus in his public ministry always did what pleased his father. That's a choice we have to make. Do you realize that? You can, either, you can either do what seems right to you and save yourself, or you can do what you know pleases God. I mean, many times you, you've been in a situation where somebody maybe even speaks the name of God in vain, and you can just keep quiet, or you can save yourself, or you can say something, or there are times when you know that God is wanting you to act but we don't, so the ability to always do the will of the Father is a learned accomplishment. It's a learned thing. That's not a thing for you to say, oh, I failed. No, you're learning how to please the Father. So when you struggle, when that happens, just say, you know what, Lord, next time I'm going to do better because I want to please the Father. I don't want to be a man pleaser. I want to be a God pleaser. And, and it has to be in our lives the same way that, that what we do is it's more important for me to please God than you. It really is. Because you're not going to be there when I'm standing before God in my birthday suit and giving an account for my life on this earth. You won't be there. As much as I want to blame stuff on you, you won't be there. It's just going to be me. I have to give an account to him. So if I know that now, I'm going to practice that now. I'm going to give an account to him. So if you're not pleased by the way I feel like I'm pleasing my father, you're going to have to be okay with that. Because I can't change that. I have to please the father as best as I know how. 
Now, isn't it, isn't it good that God's a loving and a compassionate God that, that even if you think you're pleasing the Father, and trust me, I've tried, I thought this many times. Lord, I'm doing this, and I know it, it pleases you. And God said, no, it doesn't please me. And that's where, that's where you got to start eating some crow and start realizing that just because I thought it would please God, it didn't please him. What are you going to do? You're going to be prideful and arrogant and say, well, I'm going to keep doing that, which a lot of people do, unfortunately. Or are you going to repent and say, God, I'm sorry, I thought what I did was pleasing to you. It wasn't pleasing to God. You thought it was. Maybe it pleased man. I'm, look, I, I'm going to step out. Don't record this. I'm going to step out a little bit here. Look, I know how important it is to, to most of my message is scripture. Why? Because it keeps me safe. He just said, preach the word, not your word, his word. But I'm going to tell you, I, 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 there's a lot of pastors. I, I listen to them on the radio. I don't listen to a lot of them because it drives me nuts, but I listen to some of them. And what I want to say, what are you, who are you talking to? A lot of pastors are talking to you. I'm not really talking to you. I'm talking to your spirit. I'm not trying to please your flesh when I speak to you. And that doesn't mean I'm trying to crucify it either. But I'm just saying, I'm not really speaking to your comfort level. I'm not concerned if your flesh is pleased. I'm concerned if your spirit is pleased. It doesn't matter to me if I'm not hip or hop or hip hop or whatever, or, you know, if I say the right thing or if I'm, you know, it don't matter. What matters is I tell you the truth in love and let you deal with that. Now, there's a lot of pastors that say, well, if I do that, half the congregation will leave. Well, maybe that would be a good thing. We, 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 we're careful because we don't want to offend people. Well, the, the, the word tells you itself it is a stumbling block. The gospel is an offense. Amen. It's telling people you're going to hell if you don't get saved. That's pretty offensive. It's telling people you got to live like Jesus. You got to turn from your wicked ways. You got to live in a way that pleases Father, not yourself. Now, the beauty is if we do it, if we apply it, we're better for it. We're better people. We, we learn because, look, we all have to learn to follow Jesus in the path he's cut out for us. But we, we, there's no generic cut. There's no generic way. There's no one way just all everybody fits into. No, there's a reality is that we all find Jesus on our own separate path. Amen. It's called the path of righteousness, but it's the path that God has for you. And we have to determine in ourselves that we're going we're gonna to trust God and believe God. And we're not going to just listen to what our itching ears want to hear, but we want to hear the truth of God's word. Amen. Look, it's, it's, if, it's really a good thing for preachers to read the Bible. I, I read it. I, I've read it before. I've read it. I've actually read it. And it says in the last days, this is what it says. This is what the Bible says. It's not the New York Times. The Bible says in the last days, the people will draw themselves together to that they, the teachers they want to be under because they say what their itching ears want to hear. Right. Amen. Hmm. Maybe I ought to think about that. Now, that doesn't mean you get in the pulpit and blast people and, and no. But I'm not here to tingle your ears. I'm here to speak the truth. Amen. And the best I can, I'm going to speak the truth. And it, I pray it's going to do you some good. But I pray more importantly, it's going to bring glory to the Father. Okay? Now, that doesn't make for, you know, mega churches. But I, I get to stand before God without, without any guilt. Hebrews 5.8. Jesus, a son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Wow, think of that. He was a son of God, but he learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, what does that mean, what he suffered? What he suffered was he had the Father's heart, and I wish that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. But he also knew that narrow is the gate that leads to life, and only a few find it. It's a hard thing when you want the whole world to be saved, but they're spitting in your face, plucking your beard, and telling you you're a lunatic. They're telling you that you're a liar, and that you're the father of lies, and that you cast out devils by the prince of devils. People that, they come to Jesus and say, Lord, what do I need to do? And he tells them, and they walk away, because they don't want to do it. That's suffering. That's hard. That's difficult. Putting aside personal will for another can cause suffering. When you become a child of God, 
praise God for the initial euphoria of being born again, but usually nobody, there wasn't a parade of people, you know, on my neighborhood. They were cheering with tambourines saying, praise God, you got saved. None of that happened. What happened is I realized God had saved me in a, in a special way, only a little celebration in my own heart, but real quickly I learned that I was now a different person and I had to make some different decisions. And it wasn't easy. It was hard. My other self, I could be whoever I wanted to be, do whatever I want to do, but now I got this spirit living inside of me that convicts me and tells me I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't say that. You ought to do this. You ought to do that. You ought to say this. You ought to... And, and all of a sudden, now i got something to contend with. Now i got to decide, am I going to listen to this still, small voice of the Spirit, or am I going to be like I was before? And now there's a battle, because now i got to decide whose will is going to be done, God's or mine. So Jesus was perfectly aligned with God. He obeyed regardless if it was inconvenient. How many of you know the Christian life can be very inconvenient? It, it's not about my preference. It's not about whether there's pain involved or not, or even the outcome. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of times the outcome didn't go like I thought it would go in my walk with God. Many times. I thought it would be this way, and this is how it was. And when I talked to God, he said, well, you had the wrong outcome. You had the wrong expectation. You ought to check with me and see what, you, what my expectations are before you go getting your expectations or your hopes set on something else. Outcome is different. A lot of things are different when it's in ha the hands of Father God. As believers, we have desire to do the will of God just like Jesus did. We must make our will line up with God's will. This is important. But the believer must first become a continuer. Everybody say continuer. continuer. This is out of John where he said, hey, if you abide in me, it, another translation says, if you remain in me. How many of you know a lot of people start out in, the li in life in good intentions, but not very many people finish strong? A lot of people start the race, but not everybody finishes the race. But if you're a continuer, if you continue in the word, you will certainly become a disciple of Jesus. If you continue in the things of God, if you continue serving and submitting to him, you have to continue. It's a continuation. It's a process. It's not a one-time thing. It's not an event that Jesus did. It's a life process. A lot of people struggle with that. So, well, I got saved. I did what he told me to do. Yeah, but you've got to continue in your faith, and you've got to continue believing God as you did for salvation. You've got to keep believing God for everything else in your life. And you've got to continue and abide. I love the word abide. Abide means to just be in his presence, to be in Christ, to remain in him faithful in him, not just to come to show up, but to remain in Christ. You, you know, how many of you know Jesus doesn't just meet you here on Sunday morning? He's everywhere you go. You remain in Christ when you leave this building, when you're at home, when you're at work, when you're at Walmart, when you're out in public. He's always there. You, you remain in Christ. So our attitude has to be that I have, I'm continuing with Christ everywhere I go. It's a continuous process. Whatever you do, whoever you're with, it doesn't matter. We can't be a one way with some people and a totally different way with other people. That's called a hypocrite, right? We just got to be who we are and let everything else fall how it's going to fall. Our desire must move over into ability. The new nature must mature into righteous behavior. We have to make a per our will a purposeful going to the right way to become a father pleaser, meaning it's, it's got to be an intentional thing for me that I am going to let my will crumble and his will prevail, which is moving me to a father pleaser. It has to be an ongoing issue with me day in and day out, changing my behavior, my attitude, my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, how I interact with people, what I spend my money on, what I don't spend my money on, where I go, where I don't go, the things I do, the things I don't do, all has to be a continuing process of his will over my will. Can I get an amen? Now here's the great thing, when I stumble and I fall, there's a great grace of kingdom repentance. He always forgives and he always forgets. Hallelujah. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him 
and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, what does that mean? That means as you continue in Christ, it doesn't mean you won't sin. It just means that's not your practice. That's not your intention. You may stumble, you may fall, you may struggle, but the reality is that's not what you're used to doing. It just happens because of your sinful nature. On the other side of that coin, if it's something that you keep doing because that's what you want to do, then you've got to determine where, what is going to happen in your journey. You have to decide, I need to die a little bit more to self because I have to not want to sin and I, not, I don't have to. Look, if you don't wake up in the morning planning to sin, that's a good thing. You don't want that to become your practice. You don't want it to become that your regular life. You realize you've sinned. You've fallen short. There's times we stumble. We fall. We trip. God understands that. He knows that. He's not going to come across uh, with a hammer. He's, he's got grace to cover that in Jesus' name. Because it's no longer what you really want to do. Your desire is not to sin. Your desire is to be a father pleaser. And so even if you do stumble, you repent quickly because you realize that didn't please my father. That's the difference, and that's a wonderful thing to understand. The kingdom of God is a spiritual condition. I love that. It's a spiritual con It's conditioning me. The, the kingdom of God conditions my life. It changes me, and it, and, it, and it helps me understand how to be a father pleaser because I don't really know how to be a father pleaser on my own. I really don't. But as I walk in the kingdom and as I walk in the spirit, the Holy Spirit shows me how to be a father pleaser and maybe helps me make different decisions than I would if he wasn't in my life. So I have to be properly aligned with God and obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. Look, it gets easier and easier to not only hear his voice, but to obey his voice. What did Jesus say? He said, my sheep know me because they know my voice. They don't follow a stranger because they don't recognize his voice, but they hear my voice and they follow it. Now, it doesn't mean we're always perfect, but we know that we're going in the right direction when we recognize the voice of our Savior. Let's face it. Man's will does not bear much of a resemblance to the unbending will of God the Father and his Son. We, our desires, our wills don't always line up, but if we bring our chaotic and confused will into alignment with the orderly heartbeat of God, then he can transform our will into his will. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to take our will and he wants to mold it and shape it into his will. In Luke we read, as it is written of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Hallelujah. I say that right now. Come on, Holy Ghost. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled up. Every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked places shall become straight. And the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Hallelujah. This is my prayer. Is that when I'm in alignment with God, he makes my rough places smooth. He makes my crooked places straight. He makes the hills become level. And the valleys level. Because I'm walking in his will in alignment with the purpose of God. A lot of times you talk to people, man, how's it going? Oh, man, I've been on this uphill journey for quite some time. I, I've been on uphill journeys, but eventually as you surrender to God, he makes, your, he makes your mountains become more level. He takes the crooked places in your life and he makes them straight. And he, All the rough places in our life become smooth. Why? Because he wants you to walk the path of righteousness for his sake. And the more we submit to him, the more that path becomes the way God wants it to be. You see, our mountains of pride, arrogance, anger, self-will, rebellion, and resentment must be brought down. Can I get an amen? amen? Which also means our valleys of depression, despair, and anxiety must be brought up to make a place for the coming of the Lord. God's going to take all of our ups and downs and bring them into a place of harmony. He's going to take all the rough places. Look here, he's going to say, the crooked curves of deviation from the known will of God must be straightened. The ruts of past habit patterns and our way of doing things must be smoothed out. Can I get an amen? That's what God's in the process of doing. God gives us a new nature as a gift to keep us steady while he works on us and develops our character. What does that mean? That means you got saved, but you're still being saved. Right? When you got saved, you had that experience with God, that moment when you received Christ, you gave your heart to the Lord. But you're in the process of being saved because you, you're, God's helping you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
God's, God's helping you because when you got saved, you're still pretty carnal. Can I get an amen? And even that, in that state of carnality, though being saved, you're going to heaven. But what God wants is to shape and mold you and make you more like his son so that without saying a word and without preaching the gospel with your mouth, the life you live will lead others to Christ. As he molds you and shapes you and makes you like him, the decisions you make, the things that you do, the words that come out of your mouth, the things that don't come out of your mouth, the attitude and the action that you live is going to be a, a tremendous testimony to people around you. Because, man, Pastor, I'm timid. I don't know how to share the gospel. Live like Jesus and you'll share the gospel. Amen. Surrender to God. Look, do his will. You don't have to speak. You, you, don't, you know, look at somebody like Helen Keller who was blind. She couldn't see, but, man, that woman could communicate. She, she still is being written about today. She still is remembered. Why? Because she, she didn't just allow her eyesight to be a hindrance. You don't have to allow your inability to be a hindrance. Just trust God and he'll, he'll speak through you. He'll speak for you, and he'll do the work in spite of you by his grace. As believers accepting the challenge of bringing personal will into alignment with the king, we can each sincerely say, Lord Jesus, I want to do your will as a father pleaser. Help me please you because I cannot do it without your empowerment. Hallelujah. Philippians reminds us, I can do what? All things. But watch, it's only through Christ. Amen. I can do it, but it, the biggest part of that is through Christ. Yes. I've tried and I've failed. I've stumbled. I've done what I could do. But when I begin to yield and I realize I can still do it, but I have to do it through Christ. Because he's the one who empowers me. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen. It's not about how smart I am or how talented I am. It's about how good my God is. He's not looking at me to, to find the way. He's looking for me just to be an ambassador of his righteousness. I can do all things through Christ. Now, I'm going to close with sharing some statements about being a father pleaser with you. And this is my heart this morning in teaching this message. I pray that your greatest desire is not to be a better businessman, a father or a husband or a son or a daughter, but your biggest desire in life is to be a father pleaser. Because when you please the Father, all those other things come together. When you please God and you're walking in the will of God, you, you are a better husband. You, and, and watch, let me say this again. I'm not shaming my brothers and sisters out there, but I, I, I know a lot of times what, what, what we do is we want to appeal to the flesh of man when we preach and teach the word. And what they do is a lot of times sermons are based on how to just be a better person, how to be a, a better father. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We all want to be a better father or a mother or a child of God or a servant or whatever we do. We want to be, but you know what? If, if we start from that end, going towards the Father, it's different. Instead of saying, God, I want to please you, and whatever I do, I want you to be pleased with me, how can you not be a better father? You're modeling the Father who, of all fathers. How can you not be a husband when he's the, the husband of his church? How can you not be a better son or a daughter when, when you're serving a, the, the God that created you? All those things are going to happen if you please the Father. The Bible says it this way. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. But what we want to do is we want to make sure all these things are taken care of. So we say, man, I'm going to teach a sermon on some of these things. Because what we do, we think, well, what... This is what a lot of pastors do. What's bothering people today? They go to the news headlines or they go to this. Or, okay, well, maybe people are depressed or maybe people are angry. They're fearful of the future. There's anxiety. So they teach on those. And I'm not saying that's wrong. Just hear me out. But a lot of times what we do is we focus so much on those things in neglecting, seeking first the Father, that then those things become so much more important and we try our best to work those things but if we just please the Father, God's going to give you the grace that those things are not going to overpower you. Amen. That God's going to give you the grace to be the man or the woman of God in the position he's called you to be in, to be able to focus on those things, handle those things. Why? Because don't you think God knew those things were coming? Right. Let me share it with you this way, and I'm going to move on because I'm running out of time. Watch. Jesus tells his disciples, hey, guys, I want you to get, I'm going to the other side. And I'm going to go over there, and then you guys can jump in the boat, and 
you can come after me. So they get in the boat, and they're excited, man. Hey, Jesus, you know, they're all like, he, he, he asked me to be in the boat. I, I, get, to, you know, I get to go in the boat. There's only so much room, right? So, so they're in the boat, and next thing you know, the greatest storm they ever seen in their lives comes and hits that boat. And they're fearing for their very lives. Men who, some of those men who lived on the ocean, who lived on the sea, who lived on the lake, who lived on the water, they're fearing for their lives. They're crying out. And they're terrified because they're about, they feel like they're about to die. Now, how many of you know Jesus knew that storm was coming before he asked them to get in the boat? The provision is this. A lot of times we do that and we say, man, you know, we, then, we, then we teach people how to be better sailors in the storms. But that's not the point. That wasn't the point to be prepared for the storm. You can't be prepared for that storm. That's the point. The point is you got to trust in Jesus. But what we want to do is we want to prepare people for the storms of life. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a shepherd's heart to want to prepare you for the battles and the storms of life. But let me help you. If you trust in Jesus, the storms will come and the storms will go. But you'll remain faithful because your house is built on the rock. The rain falls and the wind blows and it beats upon your house. But your house is on the rock, so it will not fall. Now watch the beauty of God. God knows the storm's coming. The storm's there. They're in the midst of it. Chaos is breaking out. But guess what God does? He's walking on the water. Standing on the circumstances that are troubling you. Uh, ruling over them. Stepping on everything that's trying to ruin your life. He's walking on it. Showing you, I have dominion over every battle, every struggle, every fear, every worry, every anxiety, every hurt in your life, every bitter resentment, everything the devil's ever tried to do to sink your boat. I'm standing on it. I'm walking on what's making you fearful. I'm walking on what the devil's using to try to ter put turmoil in your life. Hallelujah. Stand it on it. Amen. You have to say, what more could he do? Then Peter says, well, man, that's cool. I'd like to do that. And Peter says, Lord, if that's you. Because how many of you know when provision comes, we don't even recognize it? What did they say? It's a ghost. I think there's a ghost out there. <laughs> it is a ghost. The Holy Ghost was out there. And so Peter says, I want to do that. And Jesus says, well, come on, Peter. So what Peter does is because, now watch, it's nothing to do with Peter. Get this. This is, the, this is what I'm preaching about today. Peter's will, now he wants to please the Father. He sees the Father has come to the rescue. And he says, okay, Jesus, I want to do what you do. I want to please you. I want not my will to stay in the boat I want to come out in the danger because I trust you. And Jesus says, okay. Now, how many of you know it could have been any one of them in that boat he would have told that to? And Peter said, okay. So Peter gets out of the boat. And as long as Peter is pleasing the Father with his eyes on Jesus, trusting in him, he's okay. But the Bible says immediately Peter looks at what? The circumstances that got him there in the first place. Look, we can look at Jesus... Or we can look at the past. We can look at Jesus, or we can look at what's happening in the White House. We can look at Jesus, or see what's happening in society. And if you're looking at society, that's why you sunk. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Now, watch. Let's rewind this. I can moonwalk. I want to preach today on depression. A lot of you have been sinking, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address that because that's what happened when you took your eyes off Jesus. How about, forget that, how about we preach on, let's be a father pleaser and keep our eyes on Jesus and, and keep our focus on him and the cross and his love for us and his goodness and grace and mercy and kindness because if, we, if we're a father pleaser and we're seeking the will of God, then even if you do get in the storm, he's going to show up walking on the water anyway. Even if you do sink, even if you do have trouble, he's right there. 
He's right there. So let's forget about preaching on all the peripheral things. Let's preach on Jesus, who's the one who's able to catch you and provide for you and prepare for you. And even if you fall, he's there to catch you. But I got one last thing I want to say on that is when Peter did look at the wind and the waves, and which so tragically so many of us do, is that why is that more important than this? Because that's the immediate. That's the urgent. That's what you can touch. That's what you can see. That's what you can grab. That's what the news says. That's what the Internet says. And how many of you know everything on the Internet is true? Oh, it's not? <laughs> but why do we believe that? So, so, so Peter's sinking. Now he's, in, he's going down. And he reaches up, Lord, save me. And Jesus grabs his hand. He pulls him back up. And he says, Peter, why do you have such little faith? Now, how many of you have walked on the water? My best is four steps. I got four steps. I start back at the pool and run as fast as I can. I got four before I sink. But that's not supernatural. That's just because that's just I'm fast. I'll show you a video of it. You'll be laughing at me. I'll show you. In fact, I'll try to do five just to make you not laugh at me. All right, let's look at some father pleaser statements as we close. A father pleaser is a person whose ultimate desire and purpose is to preserve and maximize the sense of father's manifest presence and approval. Wow. That's what you desire is you want the father's approval and you want his presence at all times. That's a father pleaser. A father pleaser seeks to walk in his favor at all times and under all circumstances. I wish I was there. I'm not there yet, but my prayer is, God, in all the circumstances of my life, help me to be a father pleaser. God, I do it in some, but I don't do it in all. Help me under all those times of pressure and I, things I don't know and understand. Help me to still be a father pleaser. Being a father pleaser is our gift to him because we are returning to him the love he gave us at the cross. A father pleaser's personal goal is to walk at all times, under all circumstances, and without compromise in the perfect will of God. Hallelujah. That's a, a father pleaser's heart. Their goal is that. God, in everything I do, whatever I do, I want it to be in your perfect will. Father pleasers are called to freedom. Not the kind of freedom the world thinks about, but the kind of freedom that God gives us. Therefore, we are required to be free people if we are to set our hearts on pleasing him. Wow, that's powerful. Would you stand with me this morning?